I'm gonna start recording. Okay, so uh, we're doing a, essentially a continuation of the previous lecture, and I just wanted to remind you about what that was about. The idea is that we want to do joint prediction. We want to predict a joint set of variables, and the algorithm that I showed you is, is aggravate. Um, so the way that works is you start at some start state, some some initial prediction that you want to make, and then uh, you generate some initial trajectory using um, your current policy, right? And then for each decision that gets made on the trajectory, you look at the deviation. So you, you look at the deviation uh, up, you roll that out, and then uh, you look at the deviation down, you roll that out, you get losses for each of these, and then you have uh, some sort of cost vector uh, associated with the different deviations, right? So you have the cost, the, the loss that you eventually achieve, uh, you eventually observe when you deviate um, from your policy and then complete rollout with the reference policy. So are there questions about this basic approach? So, so the key observations here I think are that this is actually fairly similar to reinforcement learning. Uh, in the sense that in reinforcement learning you have to deal with the sequential decision making just, just like it's being done here. So there's, there's kind of a natural motivation to be approaching uh, joint prediction problems in a reinforcement learning approach because maybe any progress you make here can apply there. Uh, and now, then you observe that, oh, we can go just a little bit further than with reinforcement learning. We can actually get the costs of, of different uh, deviations rather than just one deviation. And that turns out to be very powerful in terms of giving you the contrastive information you need to learn well. I mean, would it make sense to think about the reference policy in a, in a way as the policy at previous time step? For example, you are continuously fighting against yourself. You yeah, we can do that. We'll, we'll get there. Okay, so today we're going to go into more details about uh, how well this works and various things. So there's several different data sets we've applied this kind of thing to. I think there's four I'm going to show you here. One of these is part of speech tagging. Uh, so this is a very simple problem where you just predict the part of speech for each word in a sentence. Uh, and um, the, the, there's some choice of which features you use, which is uh, which can be dependent upon, maybe you have some window into the words for each position that you want to predict with, or maybe you want to stem the words or things like that. So that was optimized for the CRF++ approach, which is using LBFGS. Who knows LBFGS? Okay, well, it, it's, a, it's a batch optimization algorithm. <laughs> Probably. Okay, very good. Uh, we probably won't get into covering LBFGS, but it does have certain nice properties. Um, there's various online-ish algorithms like Structured Perceptron and um, CRFSGD. So structure perceptron would be something like uh, Michael Collins worked on. Uh, CRFSGD would be something that Leon Batu worked on. Uh, Thorsten worked on the yellow line. That, that's um, the uh, orange line is something that Kai Wai worked on for his thesis. Uh, so all of these are achieving pretty good numbers in terms of the loss uh, or, the, or the accuracy here. Um, their training time tends to be fairly large. Uh, and then you can go and look at the independent prediction, which is what the black line is. That's very fast, but the training time is, uh, the training quality is uh, not so good. Oh, these are all test time, uh, test, test accuracies. And then you have learning to search with the same set of features, uh, and that works about as fast as in training as, um, as the independent prediction but the uh, accuracy is much closer to the others. And then you can, you can tune the, trend, the learning to search system and you s using over the same set of features is tuned over for the CR++ and then you get a very good accuracy very quickly. Okay, so it's important I think to see that the x-axis is logarithmic scale. So this makes an enormous difference in terms of how long you wait for a good solution. Um, so 
this is an example of what an input data set would look like. You might have the part of speech, um, and then you have some namespace, which has an individual word in it. Uh, and then these are example command lines if you want to try to do this with VW. Okay, so uh, another data set we tried this on was named C recognition. Um, again, everything is kind of tuned, everything except for the red line is using features tuned for the purple line, CRF++. Um, and you can see there's, uh, um, there's actually substantially more variety in, in how things perform. Um, I think that's because the, the size of the data set is, is a bit smaller here. So uh, working well with a relatively small amount of data is very important. <clears throat> there's still orders of magnitude difference in training time. And then the test accuracy ends up being uh, very good for learning to search approaches. What does it mean training time 10 to the power of minus 2? Uh, so the like 10 to the 0 is 1 minute. So 10 to the minus 2 would be a little bit less than a second, 0.6 seconds. <laughs> <clears throat> it's very surprising. I mean, there are these overheads, as you all said, of like just iterating over the data, loading all that stuff. Yeah. So, I mean, one of the minor benefits of VW is that it can it can run as you load the data, so there is no load the data phase. But that's what I mean. Why do you do online learning? Well, mostly you really do online learning so that you can deal with non-stationary data, because then there's just no choice, right? Uh, maybe you do online learning because online optimization is kind of the approach that you want to take to solving a problem. But then there's also this, uh, how quickly can you debug a training process gone wrong? And then online learning actually ends up being kind of helpful there. Okay, so if you look at the speed of evaluation, you see that there's an enormous difference here. Um, the uh, I mean, and you kind of expect that because essentially we're doing independent prediction except that the feature space is augmented with previous predictions in various ways. Uh, so it's, it's, it's very fast. It's, it's orders of magnitude faster than uh, these other more graphical model style approaches where you try to do some sort of viterbi like thing to decode. <coughs> So what's the model here? I mean, I understand the learning, but what's the, and I see a like this kind of a model. So we're, yeah, we don't really have a model. We have a semantics, which is we're going to be trying to minimize okay. the global loss. And the features that you're defining are local? Yeah. Okay. It's so just, just looking at the previous action. Uh, I mean, it could be the previous two actions. Uh, I forget the exact. I mean, we have to look at okay. command line in more detail, but we can maybe do that. So you just search neighbor features. This says that you look at the word before and the word after. Mm -hmm. uh, affix says that you kind of stem one. Uh, you chop one character off the beginning and the end of the word to create more features. Um, is a forty-five way prediction problem. Um, you're doing a sequence prediction, so you can, there's various ways to, to set up the sequence of predictions that you want to make. The simplest one is sequence, it's just uh, do the first and then do the second, and do the third and so forth. Okay, so, so this tells you that this, this works pretty well for this kind of relatively boring uh, problems. There's some more interesting problems where we've also tried this. Um, one is entity relation. So this is uh, Kai Wai's thesis. Um, so the 300 seconds is, is his thesis work. Uh, and then the 13 seconds is what happened when he came and visited us as an intern. And that also took six years over three, uh, three months? Uh, no, it was less than three months, I think. Um, <laughs> I don't think you'd necessarily credit the entire thesis to structure desk again. But uh, yeah, this, this does work pretty well. Um, it's relatively easy to make it work, which I think is something that is fairly important in practice. <clears throat> I think the more important thing is that 
he really tried to get it to you, that 300 seconds down. He worked very hard on that. Um, and then we also applied this to dependency parsing. <clears throat> so this is uh, applied to a suite of different problems. Um, it's comparing with uh, UL Goldberg's Dyna parser, the Stanford Neural Network, and the Stanford Neural Network parser. What's that? Parser? Yeah, I think so. How does it fare against the more recent one? I don't know. We haven't redone the experiments. Okay. I mean, I would assume that we haven't done anything, so probably if they compare with the previous experiments, then you can kind of extrapolate. I, just, I mean, I'm, I'm sure they're doing better on English, at least, because they really focus on that. In terms of having a kind of a fire and forget learning algorithms you can just apply to an arbitrary language, I think this is actually pretty good. Um, there's not a lot of tuning going on across the different languages here. Just kind of we apply it. Um, so there was a problem, by the way, with the Stanford Neural Network parser, where if a something like if a sentence had multiple roots, then it would barf, and that happens in some other languages, which is where the stars are. So uh, they often perform poorly there. <coughs> What's the uh, uh, Arabic. Why is it so hard? Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, a lot of these. How much data do you have? Yeah, so we're using one of the standard data sets. Um, I'm quite sure DARPA has a much Not if you guys are going to public deal with the uh, data <laughs> uh, but um, they, No, but there are actually interesting reasons potentially. So, data sets might be smaller, uh, data sets might be less consistent because the quality of plantation is different. Mm -hmm. And the most uh, disappointing answer is potentially arbitrary choices that are done during annotation that are less so less susceptible for learning. Where everybody is optimizing on the pantry bank, so the whole field is optimized there, and suddenly something is doing a bit differently, and everybody can't. So in general, Japanese is quite quite close. So Japanese is one where the uh, Dyna parser actually does slightly better. Which is interesting, um, but generally speaking, it seems like the link to search approach is pretty effective. And I guess the the the, the you have, compared to Yolov Goldberg's parser, um, there's sort of I mean, Yolov Goldberg's parser is more like the dagger approach than the aggravate approach, because it's just kind of saying, oh, you should go this way, not giving partial credit. For for uh, for the losses. Yeah. I mean, that, uh, his approach also might roll in with your policy, and then you have a then you take one action which is randomly chosen, uh, only with some probability, and then you go along the direction which keeps a score the same. The dynamic oracle stuff. Yeah. yeah, the dynamic oracle. This is a dynamic oracle stuff. Yeah. That's uh, the dagger. I think. It's a dagger-like algorithm, while L2S here is using the aggravate-like algorithm. So the partial credit is some benefit, of some benefit here. Did you guys try to see how it correlates with the quality of uh, the treatment? The treatment? Because I suspect that uh, the learning to search approach, especially in comparison to the Stanford one, is more resilient to errors in the uh, in train set. So it could be explored a bit more. Could be. And this is surprising. One of the key things in uh, UOS paper, the Fulbrook's paper, was that they have this R computation, so they can guarantee that you get the same score in action. Yeah, so, so we're saying like all that thing is not needed. No, 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 no. We're we're using that. That, that is our reference policy. Oh, oh, okay. But but you but you're not forced to like take the right action, right? You can take and go yeah, to like a. Uh, so th so when we want a reference policy, we're using UOS UOS Oracle. And that, that's, it's, it's important, that it does help quite a bit. Um, so having a good reference policy makes a big difference in terms of the effectiveness with which you can solve the problem. Okay, so, um, so let's talk about how we think about success a little bit in more detail. Um, okay, so you have, you have the roll-in policy, you have the deviation, and then you have the rollout policy. Those are kind of the fundamental things that we're working with. Uh, and you can try to roll in with 
either the reference or the learn policy. You can try to roll out with either the reference or the learn policy. And now the question is, how does this, what, what, what happens when you do these things? So uh, I would say a very common thing to do is actually effectively roll in with reference and roll out with reference, which is what happens when you try to treat it as kind of a supervised learning problem. So it's like kind of pre-dagger even. Um, and there you get inconsistency. And basically, um, so what do you mean by inconsistency? Yeah, so if you solve your problems well, it does not imply that you'll solve the global loss well. If you solve the local problems well, it does not imply that you'll solve the global uh, loss well. <clears throat> All right, so uh, let me see. All right, so suppose, so it, uh, there's a little search space here with S1, S2, and S3. And um, um, I forgot to review this. So I think that the idea is that the policy is A, C, and F. So in S1, you take A, and S2, you take C, and S3, you take F. And now, um, it, the, that's, that's the reference policy. And then if the learned policy deviates from this, um, you're not going to get the right training signal to, um, to, to achieve small loss. Let's see. And so let's suppose the learned policy systematically chooses B. Then um, if the learning algorithm has to either go up or down the second step, because there's a paucity of feature information, uh, it will end up going up because the reference policy says to go up in the second step. But then uh, the learned policy will end up being a BE, which gives you a loss of 100. And you're like, eh. So essentially, the, if you roll in with reference, you don't cope with the errors that reference makes, or, or with the errors that the learned policy makes. And that kind of drives things crazy. Okay, so. So, what, sorry, so why would you get the, you would get zero if only if F corrects to all the problems that B create? So if you, go, if you go S1, S1, B, S3, S3, F, and E4, how do you get a lot of zero there? So you would get a loss of, so let's suppose that our learn policy is BE. Okay. So then uh, if we're rolling in with ref mm -hmm. and we're rolling out with ref, we'll essentially be saying, okay, in S1, we deviate A and we deviate B. Mm -hmm. And uh, so if we deviate B, then we roll out with ref, we get zero because we take, uh, we, get, we have lost zero. So the reference policy takes F, not the, not E as the learned policy does. So you're, you're assuming that your loss is basically based on the last decision. Um, so each of these end states has a loss associated with it. Zero, 10, 100, or zero. Oh, okay. Okay. Right? So if your learn policy is B, E, then at S1, when you deviate, you're either going to deviate to A or you're going to B, essentially. When you deviate to B and then roll out with ref, um, you're going to end up um, having loss zero. When you deviate to A and roll out with ref, you're going to end up with loss zero. Okay, so so it, it's like it doesn't. It, you're you're telling the learning algorithm you don't care about whether or not you take A or B, because you're saying it's lost to zero both ways. Uh, and then if you deviate at S three, uh, <clears throat> um, no, you don't ever deviate at S three because you're rolling in with ref, so you only deviate at S two. That's that's the key issue with with uh, roll in ref. So you you deviate at S two. Uh, C, taking action C from S2 is much better than taking action D. And then um, you learn to prefer the up action 
in S2, which often translates to an up action in S3, but you have no experience from S3, and so you, you never actually learned to optimize the global loss. Okay, so you can prove a little theorem that says that um, you can have zero constancy of regret in, for each of the local learned predictors, but that still implies uh, an unbounded joint regret. Right, so the, the loss for the overall system. What we want is that if we train, we want the property that if we achieve small regret or small loss with each individual local predictor, that implies a small global loss. That's what we're really aiming for. Okay. Um, <clears throat> you can roll in with a learn policy and roll out with reference. So this is what the aggravate algorithm does. Okay, and that is consistent. Um, but you don't necessarily get local optimality. Okay, so what does that mean by that? What do I mean by that? Um, so let's say that our features are, are, are identified. So we have C on the lower level and we have D on the lower. But we have C in the second step and we have D in the second step. And whether or not we're at S2 or S3, we can't really make a distinction between them because the feature information is scarce. Okay, so if we're to going to S3, then we would prefer uh, to take uh, action D. But if we're at S2, um, hold on. So A is the reference policy and C is the reference policy. So when we roll out with A and C, we're going to observe a loss of one when we're in, it, in state one. And if we deviate from S1 by B to S3 and then roll out, we'll get a one plus epsilon, right? Okay, so that means that um, our learning algorithm is going to prefer to take uh, A because one plus epsilon is larger than one. So, or rather one is smaller than one plus epsilon. So our loss gets smaller if we take A. And then when we, um, when we reach S2, we're gonna deviate according to C and D, and now our learning algorithm is going to prefer D over C because one minus epsilon is smaller than one. Right? <clears throat> so now we're kind of in this weird state where um, if we deviated B and then did D, we would achieve loss zero. But because we're rolling out with reference, we can't ever really learn to do that. We're always going to end up uh, taking, uh, preferring A over B when we roll out with reference. So the reference policy is not, is not perfect. I mean, it doesn't make much of the loss. Um, that's right. Yeah. So, so the reference policy is not perfect here. I mean, don't you do this thing in, uh, in these scenarios where you roll out at different time steps and at some point you never roll out? So uh, there's a chance that the policy will actually see B comma D. Um, what, what you get, Not you when a, you're rolling out with ref. You, so you have to roll out at some point. Is that what you're saying? So when you roll out with ref, you always take either A or C. Uh, yeah. That's a, that's a definition of ref here. Yeah, that, that's fine. Uh, but I mean, you're not supposed to always roll out, right? I mean, like always deviate, I mean. Well, I think the, the general rule is that you want to have one deviation and then a roll out. 
if your reference policy is like this one and it just it doesn't really like it doesn't look great what can you say about how well you can train for this yeah so um we'll, we'll, we'll get to that in a minute but what you can say is you will be able to compete with your reference policy as long as your local predictors are good oh so this is kind of no matter what your reference policy is are you going to be able to learn to do better than uh, or about, or like the same. I think it's it's more like no matter what your reference policy is, you would like to be able to learn to do almost as well as it. Oh, okay, yeah. Okay, so um, so that's roll out with reference, roll in with learned according to aggravate. Uh, uh, so you can prove that if you have zero cognitive regret, you'll have zero joint regret. Um, Okay, you can also think about roll in with learned and roll out with learned. And then you're really falling into kind of the reinforcement learning setting. Um, so this is, this is actually a, a fairly reasonable reinforcement learning algorithm, um, but you're not taking full advantage of the information that's available in this situation. Right? And then there's it's kind of a half and half approach where you uh, roll in with learned and you roll out with Ref half the time and learn half the time. Uh, and then you can kind of optimize both your one step deviation regret and your consistency with respect to the reference policy. So you're going to try to compete with two different things. One, one thing you compete with is the reference policy, one, another thing you compete with is the, uh, the deviations from your existing policy. Okay, so um, there's a paper about that middle one. Um, I'll, I'll put it online. But the next thing I wanted to do was kind of go through the one technical bit here, which is how exactly do we talk about um, zero cost and stiff regret implies zero joint regret. <clears throat> okay, so we have high ref, which is our reference policy. We have uh, high bar, which is a stochastic average learned policy. So you have a, a policy that's, uh, uh, I mean, that policy may be changing over time in general. And so you're taking a, an average over that. Uh, you have J of pi, which is the value of the policy pi. Um, and now we want to bound the difference between the average policy that we learn and the average value of the reference policy. Okay, and we'd like to say that this is small. Um, okay, so we're going to, we're going to prove uh, that this is bounded by, okay, so it's T times the empirical expectation. So we, we have a learning process. Uh, it's going to be updating over time. Um, so that's what the N is. So, uh, and then you also have the, your time horizon. That, that's, that's the T. Uh, what's the number of steps? Is T? I'm right. The number of steps is T. The capital T. Capital T. Cap, yeah. So we're, we're thinking about a situation where we have uh, big T steps for each episode. Okay. And then little N is kind of indexing over a sequence of policies. So, so the idea is that the little a is indexing a sequence of learned policies. And what's small t? Uh, small t is just the index for the time step. Okay. So t is the horizon. Yeah, big T is the horizon. Is it fixed? I mean, sometimes it's x smaller. Let's well, just say it's fixed for simplicity for the analysis. Okay, so you have at every time step for every um, every example, which, which is the first expectation. And then you have you have a random observation, uh, a random sample, um, which is drawn dependent upon whatever randomness there is in the world. Right. So um, we're imagining there's some fundamental distribution which generates these joint prediction problems, and there's some way of creating. Uh, an observation, a set of features, that's what X is, um, conditioned on 
the time step T and the policy at in policy N, right? Our learned policy. So you roll in with a learned policy, and that's going to create a distribution over observations, basically. So you need to have that dependence upon the, the learned policy explicit. And then you have the Q function for the reference policy. Um, when you take an action according to the learned policy, minus the Q function for the reference policy, when you take an action according to the reference policy. So the difference is, is the action from the learned policy or the reference policy? Right? And if, if the reference policy is optimal, then, uh, then the Q value in a reward sense would be larger and the cost sense would always be smaller. Okay, so um, wh why are we doing this? So, so the point is here is that uh, we want to talk about the, the cost sensitive semantics that we're actually using. So since we're rolling out with the reference policy, we're really thinking about implicitly about the Q value of the reference policy from the observation that we're operating at. And then it's the difference, the difference in those values uh, is what forms the cost structure that our learning algorithm, uh, that the cost sensitive learning algorithm optimizes against. Okay, so if this is true, it, uh, we'll, we'll get to the proof in a moment, but if this is true, this means that uh, all that you have to do is predict, uh, you know, the action which will achieve a small uh, regret with respect to the Q value of the reference policy. Okay, so... Um, could even be negative, right? What's that? Could even be negative. Could be, yeah, if the reference, reference policy is suboptimal. <clears throat> okay, so I, I use Q value in a reinforcement learning sense, but you can just think of this as the loss uh, that you get when you roll out with the reference policy. Uh, I mean, we are assuming the policies are deterministic, right? Otherwise, no. the expectation of the work. Uh, it doesn't really matter. You can deal with expectations easily. easily. But for simplicity, determinism is fine to think about. Okay, so, so that's the theorem. And hopefully you can see from the theorem that if you, that this is in fact the objective which is presented to the learning algorithm. And so if you minimize that, uh, the, the, the thing on the right, uh, that will imply minimizing a global loss, or at least achieving a global loss close to what the reference policy achieves. So this is why the dynamic oracle that you have did is important, because that has j pi ref is large, or large in reward sense or small in a cost sense. OK. So let's, let's think about how this works as far as a proof uh, a little bit. Um, okay, so for any policy, we'll think of pi sub t as playing the policy for rounds one to little t. And then we'll play uh, pi ref for rounds uh, t plus one to big t. Um, so pi big t is just pi because you, Every round is played according to the policy pi, and pi zero is just pi ref. So those are two extremes. <clears throat> okay, so the difference in values between a policy and pi, uh, between policy pi and pi ref, can then be broken up into the difference in values at each individual time step. So you're going to just use essentially telescoping. So uh, we said that j, we said that pi t equals pi, so that's the first term, j pi, uh, and then pi zero equals pi ref, so that's the second term. And then the sum is just an identity because uh, terms cancel out. Okay, so then, uh, okay, so the, the value of the policy can be thought of as 
the value when you roll out with pi ref, and you need to take an action according to pi, or take an action according to pi ref for each term in this sequence. Okay, because we're only just we're only off by one in each in each term. <clears throat> Okay, so then, um, okay, so we have this sum over time steps, which you can think of as just an average over time steps times t. Okay, so that's, that's minor. Um, and then um, the, this applies for any policy pi, right? There's no assumptions about what pi is here. And that means that it applies to uh, this average stochastic policy over your learning process. So we have some, we have an identity which holds for every policy, so it holds for any average over policies, and we just slide that into the sum. Your computer is going to die. What's that? Your computer is going to die. Really? How do you know that? Uh, there was a warning on that tree. Interesting. Uh, <laughs> is there power? Um, yes, there is. Okay, so this is the one proof for this section. Um, this is the uh, what if you gain by a replacing it with average in terms of the uh... um, so if you have an online learning algorithm that achieves a small regret with respect to uh, your constitutive loss then um, that that means it will actually start predicting well right uh, for the average, so if you have an unlinear algorithm, it's changing at every for every n. Its regret is going to become small. So your your your, your regret for the local de decisions becomes small, and then the that's going to that that applies to the average over everything, and then that implies that the that the joint regret will become small. So there's kind of a two-step process here, implicitly. One of them is going from the, dis the decision regret to the joint regret. So what do you mean yeah. joint regret? The, the regret for the, the, the joint set of predictions. Okay. So that's what the J pi minus J pi ref is really getting at. Mm -hmm. But then you also want to actually achieve a small regret for, um, for the local predictions. And that's, that's non-trivial here because the distribution, so it's not like there's a fixed distribution here. So the, it, because your policy is influencing the observations that it sees yeah. later on, the learning process for the first time step influences the observations that are happening at the second time step, right? And that means you need a stronger notion of convergence than just, oh, things are IID and I compete with the best predictor according to some IID thing. Instead, you need something like the online notion, learning notions of convergence, which have to do with smaller regret with respect to a possibly average chosen sequence. Okay, I mean, I think that, like, so average helps. <laughs> so regret in an online learning sense is defined, defined with respect to the empirical ad, average of observations. Ah. Right? So this, this is saying that we have a regret guarantee going from local prediction to joint prediction, which is compatible with the regret guarantees which occur for online learning algorithms. Other questions? Oh, I, I, okay. I mean, by average, you meant here the average alert, like the pi t's, right? So it's the same policy rolling out, rolling with it. 
it's not like you're training the pi and then you take the average or whatever. <laughs> the, that's what you meant? That's what I meant. Okay. You're actually training the pi, the policy. We're imagining an online learning algorithm is getting applied here because of the non-stationarity, which is inherent in the, in the problem definition. So that, that online learning algorithm is getting applied. This, the set of uh, features uh, and observations that are, are being made at time step 10 can change radically over time. But you would still like to have some kind of regret guarantee that no matter how it's changing, it's going to compete with the best predictor for time step 10, right? So online learning algorithms give you that guarantee, but that guarantee does not hold respect to an individual sample or distribution. It, it holds respect to the empirical sequence of observations that you make. And, and in particular, it holds respect to the average of, of those empirical observations. So if I wanted to, I could go into detail about online learning guarantees and I could say, oh, uh, this difference here uh, at the end, um, is bounded by something like square root t, or one over square root t, uh, and then by on the learning algorithms. Okay. You seem suspicious. Uh, I mean, not completely like following the, uh, <clears throat> the square root t part. Because this is, this is, I think, a really important point. Um, when you want to do joint prediction, you must if you want to do it in a learning to search style or when you want to do reinforcement learning. In both cases, there is no fixed distribution over samples that you're optimizing against. Your actions are influencing the distribution that you're observing. And that means that your notion of convergence of, of what is a good learning algorithm needs to take that into account. You can't just say, oh look, I have some potential and I optimize it. You have to say, I have an online learning algorithm which will actually do the right thing um, for any sequence of observations that it gets. Right? It'll, it'll minimize the regret, so it'll, it will compete with a set of policies. So this is, this is kind of a step where we're kind of forced, is it, there's several different ways to talk about competing with policies. One of them is, uh, you know, the world is IID, and now we're gonna, the, the best policy in the set is going to be have an empirical value close to its true value, and so we can just select it out. Um, and another approach is more the online learning approach where you say, look, I have an algorithm, I'm going to guarantee that it competes with a set of policies, and, and that may be competing on a changing distribution of, of observations. <clears throat> so that, that, that guarantee becomes important in this setting and in reinforcement learning settings. Sure, but how, I mean, how does the average, I mean, so that's, that's, that's okay, but I mean, how is the average taking that into picture? The regret in an, for online learning algorithms is with respect to the average over all of the individual data points. Okay. <clears throat> so let's talk about programming for a minute. Um, in general, if you want to define a state space and then uh, and in actions for every individual state, you start doing finite state uh, programming, which is super annoying. However, it turns out that we can actually code these things up very, very easily by using a identification between a function in a functional programming sense and a search space. <clears throat> so if you Hal went in and he tried to figure out how many lines of code are associated with the actual uh, training and prediction parts for each of these different toolkits. So there's CRFSGD, which is in Batu's code. There's CRF++, which is doing the LBFGS. There's structured SVM. I think this might be Thorsten's code, I'm not sure. And then there's the learning to search, where very, very few lines of code are actually required to code this up. Um, now, I think lines of code is kind of the wrong thing to look at, but I think it, it actually does, there's other things to look at as far as the ease of programming, which are actually more important, but the point here is that it is, you need just very few lines of code to actually do these kinds of things. Are they all in the same language? Um, 
CRFSGD, CRF++, and Linux Research are all in C++. I think the SSVM is in Java. So I think Java, okay, Java might be a little bit more verbose than, but I don't think it's dramatic. <clears throat> okay, uh, I think counting lines of code is, is kind of, it, it's focusing on the wrong thing, but I do want to emphasize that this is relatively easy to program. Uh, and this is what it looks like for um, for the sequential sequence predictor in VW. You you loop through your examples. Uh, you call predict, um, giving his advice the label if uh, if the label is available, um, and not giving any label if there is no label available, uh, and then you just. Uh, you call loss, uh, just doing handling loss. And so, did, did the was the prediction right or wrong? Um, that's basically the code. This is this is I think too simple. But what's going on is you're you sort of specifying the structure of the decoder. Uh, so, think about lines one, two, and four as the decoder. It's just go through, make a prediction, make a prediction, make a prediction, make a prediction, and then you are providing some reference advice in terms of the label that's available and the loss that's available. That's, that's, that's all that's really going on here. Okay, so this is, I think, too simple to really understand what's going on. You can also think about the dependency parser and the, the high-level structure of the dependency parser, which again was about 300 lines of code in total, is, well, we say we're gonna have a stack, we're gonna have a buffer, which is each of the words in the sentence, we're going to have a set of arcs that we've committed to for a dependency parser. And then we're going to uh, figure out what the valid actions are given the state of the stack and the buffer. And then we're going to get the features for those uh, individually. Uh, and then we're going to um, we're going to call Yoav's um, uh, gold um, parser. Or, um, <laughs> You have Goldberg's gold, yes. Um, it gives us kind of the, the, what the reference policy would do in any given state. And then we call predict, feeding in the features, the, the reference policy to action, and a set of valid actions. And then that uh, outputs a, an action. And then we transition the system. Uh, maybe uh, another arc is committed to, or maybe something gets pushed into the sack, whatever's appropriate. And um, after we run out of a buffer uh, and stack, uh, we just declare some sort of loss. <clears throat> okay, so this is this is a relatively straightforward uh, parser structure, uh, and that, that's it's really what the code looks like. Obviously, I've abstracted a little bit, but it's not too different from that. Okay, so you can make a claim. You can say that uh, every algorithm which always terminates, takes as input uh, relevant feature information X, uh, makes zero or more calls to predict, and reports loss and termination, uh, defines a search space implicitly. And furthermore, uh, for any search space, such an algorithm exists. So this is, this is super handy because it means you can kind of mix code and learning in a way that you might have not thought of previously, not thought about. So are there questions about this? Let me um, just emphasize things. Let me go look at the code. So this is on uh, uh, this is in the Vopal Wabbit code base. Let me go look here, and then we go down to uh, the search tasks. So there's various entity relation is here, dependency parser is here, sequence is here. Sequence actually has several different ways to do sequences. There's 
the vanilla sequence task. There's also sequence span, which is, which is used for name and recognition, and so forth. You can just kind of code up these tasks um, relatively easily and use them. Um, you can do it in Python also. So this is, this is kind of this is some magical stuff because you can create a Python function, which gets you send to a C++ library that invokes the Python function over and over again in the process of optimizing. <clears throat> okay, so so the more important thing in the lines of code is that you don't get the several bugs you kind of systematically avoid in this approach. You don't have a training and testing mismatch. I think it's very common to have that unless you have some sort of unified uh, view. Um, it's also pretty straightforward to understand uh, why things are slow if they're slow. Uh, if you're if you're operating in a high level language, it can easily be the case you make a minor change which appears minor, uh, and then uh, and then it actually ends up blowing things up. So if you add an extra arc to a graphical model that can have a dramatic effect on the convergence and runtime for your learning algorithm. Here, I think it's a bit more straightforward to understand what's going on. Uh, and then um, you kind of always compensate for the cascading failures in your learning algorithm. And so if, you, if your learning algorithm makes mistakes, it learns to cope with those mistakes. And that's a very good property to have. <clears throat> Okay, so now I'm going to go through some other kind of issues and approaches. Uh, are there any questions about programming this kind of approach? I mean, just one quick question. So yeah. your, this approach assumes that the policy is dependent only on the local features, right? Because I'm asking because like nowadays the yeah. RNNs are dominating yeah. the NLP, yeah. and RNNs are implicitly like taking the entire history of actions yeah. into account. There was this recently this paper on called Deep Search Optimization by Alexander Rush. Mm -hmm. And they were doing something, I mean, it's not really the same, but some ideas are shared. For example, getting a reward only at the end, removing train test mismatch. Um, but they were doing a beam search because there is no way you can actually. Uh, so this is not inherently incompatible with carrying information uh, from earlier predictions. So, so RNNs and LSTMs, things like this, they carry information from earlier in the prediction process in, let's call them channels. So you have a bunch of channels, they're, they're essentially wires with the values. Those wires with values get updated at each step in the process. Uh, there's nothing inherently incompatible about this approach, but you need to, I think w there's the proof, the onus of proof is sort of on us to prove that those are compatible. We haven't done that yet, right? I believe that the two approaches can be combined and they will be beneficial to do so. Have, have people tried to use the RNNs uh, learning to search? I mean, there's something called scheduled sampling. I mean, but, uh, yeah, so scheduled sampling is an, um, <laughs> dagger decision. kind of a dagger-like style thing. This yeah. is what Sammy Benjua worked on. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think people kind of, so I think there's two difficulties here. One of them is for neural network people, the idea of non -di uh, of discrete decisions is kind of eh, because they would really like to make the decisions be continuous; so they can differentiate across them. Yeah, but the decisions are discrete, right? Uh, the, 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 when the two decisions are discrete, they really need to deal with that. And I think that not every neural network person has really understood that. Uh, uh, that's one issue. The other issue is just that the if if, you, if we go back to here, the kind of control that you need to have over your learning process is much better suited to a CPU than a GPU. Uh, so this, is, this is conditional computation. Conditional computation on a GPU is, is much more awkward. Uh, so uh, although I'm, I'm positive that these two approaches can be married, um, I think there's, there's some doing that needs to be done in terms of actually doing it. Right, programming it up and getting a system that actually works in a performant way. I mean, when the RNNs are implicitly have a discrete action, so you just pick one of the keywords at every time step and then feed it back in. So the the policy is discrete uh, <coughs> in terms of the actions, if not the state. Yeah, that's right. 
Iron and Zone actually work that well on GPUs. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's, let's talk about a few other details um, to wrap up. So there's several areas that are kind of related to uh, this kind of learning to search approach. There's imitation learning. Um, there's several papers here that discuss those. Um, there's kind of training a classifier to mimic an expert's behavior, which is what Dagger is doing. Um, the dynamic oracle that Goldberg worked on. Uh, there's the learning to search papers. Um, so I would say CERN was the first one which kind of achieved a small regret guarantee. This was Hal Downs' thesis a while ago. Um, Aggravate is an improvement on that. Um, it's, it's a cleaner analysis and cleaner uh, in various ways. Um, <clears throat> if you have a suboptimal reference policy, it's like that half and half thing that I showed you. Then uh, there's a paper at ICML 2015 uh, talks about how to analyze that. And the code is in VW. Um, another related approach is inverse reinforcement learning. So um, here what happens is given observed expert behavior, you try to infer some underlying reward function just the, 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 that's kind of consistent with what the expert is actually doing. Uh, so there's several papers on this, um, proposals, solutions. Um, there's a nice paper in, from Andrew Ng uh, in 2000, talking about how to, to create, um, how to do inverse reinforcement learning from sample tra trajectories, right? Um, and then there's a lot of apprenticeship learning work, which is also along these lines. So, okay, so what are sort of the defects in a learning to search approach? Um, one of them in my mind is uh, you really want to be able to automate the search order because right now you have to specify, oh, I want to do this prediction and that one and then that one. Or maybe you go this way and then you go back. Or something but you have to actually specify that in your program <clears throat> so you can think of graphical models as essentially specifying dependencies but not needing to specify a search order uh, so to the extent that they work that, that's nice there's problems because the computation can blow up rather easily uh, it would be nice to have a system where the computation does not blow up but the search order does not need to be specified Okay. Um, the reference policy is often critical and not entirely obvious. There was a recent paper from, uh, I know that it, it was something that Joel Peño worked on, but also Yasuo Benjo was on the paper and several other authors talking about kind of automatically learning up. You, since you, you have two policies, you have your learned policy and then you have another policy which has access to the label information. Uh, so it has sort of cheating information at training time. And th that is being used as the reference policy, essentially. So that seems kind of promising. That, that's a, an approach to automatically form a reference policy, given labeled information. Is it by any, any chance called the professor forcing? Called what? The professor forcing algorithm. I forget. Okay. <laughs> um, another issue that can come up is we're reducing the cost of classification. So if you're choosing one of k things, it's okay when k is 10 or 100, but it becomes not okay when k is 100,000. You'd like to be able to choose uh, one of 100,000 things in the machine translation-like setting. Uh, so uh, we'll probably have another class later on talking about how to do logarithmic time classification, but there's, there's a fundamental issue here because uh, specifying 100,000 costs has a time which is fundamentally like order 100,000. Um, so you want to have a different interface to the, the base learning algorithm than, than what we're talking about here. <clears throat> right, and then uh, as I said, this isn't using a GPU. Uh, so don't take advantage of 
some of the new neural network type things. Um, okay, so we're trying to optimize a discrete joint loss. And the claim is that you want to do this by, you, you, you sort of want to optimize the programming complexity. So you want to make it as easy as possible. Uh, so um, I would say the most common approach to solving joint loss problems is to just ignore the structure and predict everything individually. Uh, this tries to address that. Um, you want a good prediction accuracy. Uh, you want the training speed to be good, and, uh, and you want the test speed to be good. So I think all four of those are satisfied here fairly well. Um, I expect to see, I mean, I, I see an increasing number of papers which are using learning to search like techniques, um, often in a bit more, well, there's kind of a ladder of approaches, right? So there's sort of, do you just try to, do, to predict what, the, uh, what, a, what a demonstration does? And then there's, do you try to predict what a demonstration does taking into account your own errors? And then there's, do you try to predict what a, uh, what a demonstration does taking into account your own errors and grounding your semantics in the eventual reward or loss that you actually achieve? So in, e in each step in there, you get a better and better algorithm, uh, assuming you can actually take that step. <clears throat> Okay, so that's it for today. Are there questions or things we should go through? Okay, thank you.